My topic is human consciousness, and I'm going to try to um, argue what it is, where it comes from, and how it relates to uh, the body. So a little bit of background about consciousness. Um, this topic has been kind of a controversial topic throughout history and philosophy and science also. Uh, because consciousness is immaterial, it's very hard to prove um, any facts about it. So in philosophy, we have Plato, who uh, argues that it comes from the transcendental, and uh, Descartes, who argues that consciousness is purely physical, or comes from the physical. So research today is done basically like this. I don't know if you can see that picture, uh, but that's a Tibetan monk who is meditating <laughs> uh, with electrodes in, his, in, electrodes in his head. So the only way you can conduct research uh, on consciousness is to alter or to monitor the brain while art altering the states of consciousness. So we have meditation, sleep, or psychoactive drugs. Um, so these are the facts that we know about the brain. An awake brain is aware, but a sleep or dead brain is not. That's pretty logical. Uh, the brain is equally active during sleep and awake stages. And also, this suggests that our brain needs a certain type of activity to be conscious. Um, so this slide basically shows all the states of consciousness. And not to be any more controversial, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the circle in the middle, which basically calls it ordinary consciousness, or kind of this sensory awareness. Um, because a lot of people talk about higher consciousness, or when we say the word consciousness, they connect it to spirituality or uh, you know, being a part of universal consciousness. But that's another lecture. Uh, maybe <laughs> next year I can talk about that. <laughs> so how do we go from the physical to the mental? Uh, I argue that consciousness is a state of awareness. And to be conscious is to be aware of sensations. So we, we experience a stream of consciousness instead of uh, experiencing a mind, as most people would think. Uh, so I argue that we don't have a mind. Because when people say, when people refer to the mind, they say something is in my mind or on my mind. And they also po point to their head. Uh, I argue that consciousness is not in our head uh, <laughs> if you use the mind as synonymous to consciousness. Uh, but also, we cannot experience the mind. We experience a stream of consciousness. So consciousness is immaterial. It doesn't have uh, mass, weight, uh, shape, size, taste. Uh, so, and it's also not local, because if something is not physical, you cannot lo localize it. Uh, so if you imagine a sunset, a beautiful sunset, and you allow a neurosurgeon to cut into your brain, <laughs> he's not going to see a sunset. Uh, he can track your neurons by electricity, but the only person who will see the sunset is you, which means that this is in your consciousness. It's not physical. So there was a neurosurgeon in the 40s and 50s uh, who was interested in consciousness and was using uh, his surgeries as uh, a place where he can experiment. So he had a patient one time. Um, and back then, they used ether for uh, anesthesia, so people were awake <laughs> during surgery. So uh, he was stimulating the frontal lobe and actually moving the patient's arm. And when he told them to think about stopping the arm, uh, which relates to consciousness, uh, the, the arm actually stopped moving. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting anecdote. Uh, so I argue that the mental is an emergent property of the physical, uh, which means that consciousness is an emergent property of the nervous system. Uh, and that's what I will go further. Here I have a picture of a stream that's aware, <laughs> and <laughs> it becomes a stream of consciousness. Right? So what is an emergent property? Uh, it is a quality that an entity has, uh, which none of the components that make that entity have by themselves. So the most basic example is water. If we take uh, two molecules of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, 
uh, we actually get water which is wet, uh, but hydrogen gas and oxygen gas are not wet by themselves. Um, so in terms of the nervous system, if we go from cells to tissues uh, to organs and then organ systems, all of these are emergent properties of each other. So we can argue that a cell could have consciousness because some people uh, use consciousness synonymously to be al being alive. So a cell is alive, but a cell cannot form an idea. So it doesn't really have this kind of consciousness that the nervous system has. Uh, this kind of, uh, it doesn't have consciousness like the nervous system. So the nervous system performs the most complex functions uh, in our whole body. Uh, thus, consciousness occurs at this level. So how do we go from sensations to ideas, um, which occur in our consciousness? So we interact with the world uh, using our five senses. And the purpose of the nervous system is to detect um, sensations and then transmit them uh, using neurons to our brain, where they get uh, interpreted. And it basically functions like a binary system. Uh, it uses presence and absence of stimuli, mm. but it's much more complex than a binary system. Uh, so a good example of this is when you, like, you can distinguish between having a cramp in your leg and tasting ice cream. That's mm -hmm. pretty obvious. But also, having a cramp in your leg is different than having a uh, burning pain in your leg. Uh, which makes our nervous system much more layered than a binary system. So if you type on a computer, the computer just knows what you typed in. It doesn't know how hard you typed or you know, any other layered um, that, come, that came from you. It just knows stimuli response, stimuli response. So sensations. Um, sensations are a actually information. Uh, and information, uh, if it doesn't have structure, it doesn't have meaning. So it's just kind of information by itself. Um, so to, in order to get from sensations to ideas, we've, the first step is to uh, interpret the information uh, by giving it meaning. And how do we do that? Uh, we actually give it structure. So how do we get meaning? Uh, structure information equals meaning. Differences in structure means difference in meaning. So ex an example of this is the Morse code. Uh, it uses just one pitch of a sound, and then the different lengths of these sounds uh, produce many different meanings. Uh, also the, ver the word volume, uh, you can use it saying what is the volume of this bottle, um, turn down the volume, or saying, I don't think anybody says it, this anymore, but pass me the third volume from the fifth shelf, right? <laughs> so, what is the meaning of life? Have you tried Googling it? <laughs> so, from meaning, we made a system of meanings or concepts, which is language, uh, in order to uh, use these meanings and connect them. So a language is essentially a system of concepts, and all words in language are defined by other words, which means no word has a fundamental meaning. Um, so studies show us that different uh, language communities see the world differently and also think differently, uh, which suggests that we think in language. And I would suggest that uh, another uh, proof that reality comes from this way, not from outside in, uh, is seeing, uh, let's say you have an electrician, an artist, and an engineer enter a room. They all have different bases of knowledge, and they all use different vocabulary, and they all see different rooms. So I would suggest that the more words you know, and the more knowledge you have, the more you're aware of the world around us. Also, uh, for example, Eskimos, they, have, they see uh, different shades of white in their en environment, 
And, but that's also because they have names for, for these different shades of white. Here we only have one shade. We have 50 shades of gray. But <laughs> <laughs> so, going from language to ideas. So what is an idea? I, an idea is an opinion or, or a belief or a thought. Um, so uh, language helps us, um, obviously using, we also may use language to make ideas. But uh, going from sensations, we name physical things. But when we're trying to name things that are not physical, but we believe in like uh, liberty, justice, um, or loyalty, let's say, that's not physical, that's an idea. So we use language to, uh, to make, uh, make ideas, which means that ideas are an emergent property of language. Uh, so from sensations to ideas. Sensation, meaning is an emergent property of sensations, language is an emergent property of meaning, and then ideas are an emergent property of language, and that all of this stuff happens in our consciousness. So how does consciousness relate to the body? Um, Rene Descartes thought that it um, interacts with the, that the mental interacts with the physical and the pineal gland. Um, since the mental is not material, it cannot be in one place. Uh, so that makes it automatically wrong. <laughs> and <laughs> the, the physical and the mental don't cause each other. It's a two-way interaction. So, but, so, so I put there, correlation does not mean causation. Um, and consciousness is thus in our, in our entire body. It, it, is just, it, it is not just in our brain. Uh, and in the consciousness interacts uh, with the body through experience. So a good example of this is pulling out a gun in public. Since we all know what a gun does, we would all experience physical and mental symptoms. So a mental sim symptom would be fear, uh, racing heartbeat, uh, blood pressure going up. Uh, but if somebody never saw a gun before or didn't know what it does, they would not experience the these symptoms. So the experiencer, which is mental, is the subject. And the experienced, which is physical, is the object. The body is both the subject and the object or can be. Uh, so if we touch something, the body is the subject. If we're watching somebody, the body is the object. But all of you who can see yourselves in the mirror here behind, you're both the subject and the object at the same time. So self-consciousness. It is not synonymous with consciousness as a sensory awareness. Uh, consciousness aware of sensations, uh, this Animals and infants possess this, but as adults, we are also able to be aware of being aware, which is called self-consciousness. So if a baby had a black marker stain on its forehead and it saw itself in the mirror, the baby would reach towards the mirror to erase the marker stain. An adult wouldn't do that. Uh, because the baby is not aware of being separate from its environment, and we as adults are. Uh, so how do we become self-conscious? Uh, usually when we enter society. So a good example of this is a group of kids uh, being in a public place, joking around, cursing, and then all of a sudden they, f they realize there's an adult behind them and they all stop. So <laughs> this, this means that we become more self-conscious in front of people of authority and also uh, in front of people who we think they're more, <coughs> that are intelligent or important. So if you were to meet the president, you would be more self-conscious than if you were talking to a friend or something. Um, we also become, th that means that we become uh, more self-conscious in relationship to others. Um, in terms of other people's consciousness, we cannot prove that they have it, but we see that people are awake and walking around, and if we touch them, they will feel it. So we can infer that they are also conscious. Uh, but the problem we make is that, um, going back to race with the earlier lecture, that the more we look alike, the more our consciousness is the same. 
and this is not usually the case. So these are some pictures of describing self-consciousness. <coughs> Identity. So our brain's physiology allows us to generate ideas, thoughts, dreams, fantasies, uh, which uh, make up our identity. So our, our identity is usually hindered towards uh, memories and relationship to other people. So if we were to keep our uh, memories and switch bodies, we would most likely keep the same values and beliefs. Um, so in terms of age, race, and nationality, that means that our uh, identity is uh, always, always depends on comparison to other people. So if you are a white middle-aged American uh, and you are in America, it's much different than being a white middle-aged American in Japan. Um, so the context, when, when the context changes, the identity changes as well. And our identity is constantly changing. So throughout life, as we gather experience, we change our beliefs, we change our memories constantly, so, which means that our identity is constantly changing. So Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher, said, um, you can never step twice into the same river, which means that whenever you step into a river, you're always a different person. And since the river is always flowing, it's always a different river. So here's a identity crisis. <laughs> with the, uh, <laughs> So in conclusion, uh, what I want you to remember is that consciousness is a state of awareness, this ordinary consciousness is a state of awareness, and it means that we are aware of sensations. It's an emergent property of the nervous system. Uh, we go from sensations to ideas through meaning and language. Uh, consciousness interacts with the body through experience. Uh, to be self-conscious is to be aware that you are aware. And identity is hindered to memories, beliefs, and relationship to other people. And it's constantly changing. So, thank you all. This is more excited. And thanks for listening.